Hi, I'm uh, Carl Schultz, and we're at the Bizadny Fisheries Facility at their annual open house to demonstrate the uh, salmon stripping and uh, f uh, operation. And uh, we have uh, as our special guest Mike Baumgartner, who is the manager of this extremely fine Bizadny facility. I should mention, too, because the people in Door County would like to know that Buzz Bizadny was Roy Lucas's first cousin. So, Mike, could you tell us uh, a little bit about this uh, fine facility? Uh, sure. Uh, we'll start out, I guess, with a little bit of history. Um, the facility uh, has been here since about uh, the early 90s, since, uh, well, we've been actually taking fish since, um, like, 1990, the fall of 1990. And uh, we actually needed a facility like this because the, the salmon don't spawn naturally in um, our streams here in Wisconsin. And so, you know, instead of us being um, dependent on other um, states for uh, eggs uh, to um, keep our salmon fishery going here on our side of the lake, um, we needed a place where we could collect eggs reliably to um, keep our uh, uh, facility and our, our um, uh, the fishery out in Lake Michigan going. Because the salmon don't spawn naturally here, um, we need to do what Mother Nature can't yeah. or isn't able to here. Yes. So um, it, we just looked around for a place to do that and the Kiwani River, we, have, we had uh, lots of public access uh, on the river here and uh, we always had uh, real good annual uh, spawning migrations of the salmon. And um, that's why uh, we're. That's why the the place is here. Essentially, what we've done is tied into the salmon's natural instinct to swim upstream. I guess I better back up. We tie into their natural instinct to come back to their home stream to spawn. And so, uh, what they do is uh, they come upstream from Lake Michigan when they're um, uh, mature to spawn as adults, and uh, they'll run into a, a low head dam that we have on the river here. And then we also provided a back uh, a bypass for that uh, for the fish that they can swim up that is attached to a um, a fish ladder and the fish ladder then leads to some collection ponds that we have and we collect the fish in those collection ponds and uh, once we get enough fish in the collection ponds to process then we'll uh, get a crew together uh, from various stations uh, like we're doing on a day today um, a day like today. Um, and we'll collect the eggs from the returning adult trout and salmon. It's actually, um, it's not just a salmon uh, run. We actually work with um, uh, brown trout, uh, steelhead or rainbow trout, Chinook salmon, and coho salmon. Those are the four species that we work with here. And um, once the fish are in the ponds, what we do to process them is we uh, force them into uh, an elevator system and then we lift them into the building a couple of dozen at a time. And um, then from there, we check to see if the fish are ripe and then um, we uh, spawn the fish if they are ripe. And then the eggs are collected by a hatchery. Um, depending on what species it is, depends on what hatchery they go to. But um, the, the, we don't, we don't uh, hatch any eggs here or um, raise any fish. All we do is serve as kind of a transfer station for um, adult fish or eggs. Uh, once the eggs are um, collected and fertilized, then they're sent to the, to the hatcheries where they're raised uh, to fingerling size, and then from that point, they're stocked pretty much throughout the, the you know, our um, lakeshore area. Yeah. Um, those fish, a portion of them do go do uh, are stocked into the Kiwani River, but they are stocked throughout uh, the waters of Wisconsin. And what happens is, and the reason we get the fish to come back here is we fool them into thinking this is their home stream. We do that by stocking them before they go through an imprinting process where they remember the chemical kind of the chemical smell of the water in the Kiwani River, so that as they're when they're right, when they're um, mature, they run into that smell out in the lake of the Kiwani River and something snaps in their head and says this smells familiar I need to turn here so that's why the fish are coming back here um, and we go through uh, in the fall especially we go through about um, five to six thousand fish each fall yeah. um, and that's all four species of fish that we yeah. that we run into thank you
Mike, that was an excellent, excellent overview of the, uh, this facility and, and what you're doing here. You're welcome. And certainly uh, this is critical to the great uh, sports fishery in, in Lake Michigan. It, it's definitely critical. Yeah. My name is Kathy Dax. I'm the naturalist here at the facility. Um, I've given one tour already and I've got a cold. So um, if you can't hear me, I'm starting to lose my voice a little bit. So let me know if you need me to speak up at all throughout the tour, um, and I'll do that for you. Uh, you're at a DNR facility. <laughs> you're at the Basadney Fisheries Facility. We are an egg collection facility only, and we're an anadromous egg collection facility. That means that we work with fish that come back home to spawn or return home to spawn. Not all fish do. We work with Chinook salmon, coho salmon, rainbow trout, and brown trout. Right now, we're in the beginning of the Chinook salmon run. That's what's happening here today. Um, so you'll get to see a lot of fish if you haven't already. Before we kind of get all organized and ready to go on this tour, we're gonna talk again. The, first, the next time we're gonna talk is down by the observation deck, which is um, right on the Kiwani River. And we're gonna walk down there the same way that we walk back. So, um, and we're gonna stop on the way back and take a look at the collection ponds and the fishway and the viewing room and the workroom here. And we'll end our, our tour with um, our fisheries biologist, Paul. So if you haven't heard his little, his little um, spiel, he will. Um, he does our fish dissection for us. Let's take a walk down to the observation deck and I'll talk to you a little bit there about the history of the Lake Michigan fisheries, a little bit about where you're at on the Kiwani River, the life cycle of the salmon, and we'll kind of do all that sort of thing down by the, by the viewing, or by the observation deck. This weather is different too. The fish aren't going to be as active today, I don't think, because of the heat, but we have cloud cover which helps because they tend to be a little bit more active as the clouds, um, as we have cloud cover as opposed to bright sunshine. Um, so the salmon that you see here today are Chinook salmon. Um, they just started their run. We just turned our ponds on Tuesday. So all the fish that are up in our collection ponds have been there just since Tuesday. Um, so we're just starting to collect the fish uh, this far. A little bit about to orientate yourself so you're kind of familiar with where you are on the river. Lake Michigan is seven to nine miles through the Kiwani River in this direction. So down river is this way, up river of course would then be this direction. And Lake Michigan is about seven miles if you took a walk through the river. So the salmon that are here today have traveled at least that seven or eight miles, seven to nine miles through the river to get to us. And this year, um, outside of this last week where we've had some rain, it's been quite dry in this area. So much so that um, I could easily have walked across the river with knee boots on um, because it was so low. So the salmon up until this week have had really low water to deal with. And even as you look down river, you'll probably see some tails and dorsal fins sticking out because the, the river still is pretty low. But this is the first time since probably spring we've had water flowing over the dam. So we've really had low water conditions. And that makes a difference too when we look in the fishway. You'll notice the fish are going to be a little bit more beat up than they may have in years past. And when they get in the workroom, you'll see that too when they're, they're taking eggs in the, in the window. You'll notice how white their bellies are from dealing with all that low water as they're trying to get, get up to us. A little bit about um, the history of Lake Michigan's fishery, so you can um, appreciate while we're, what we're, why we're here, why we're here. Um, these salmon are traditionally Pacific Ocean salmon. Chinook salmon, coho salmon, even the browns and the rainbows are not native to Lake Michigan. We stock them here, the DNR stocked them here in the 60s to control the alewife population. So when I give tours in the, uh, during the week to little kids who don't have a clue what alewife are, and if you live in Algoma or um, Sevastopol or any of the other areas around here, you know that alewife is that small little fish. And in the 60s, um, even if you probably lived in Algoma, you probably remember this, um, there we had an overabundance of alewife. I mean, there were so, the population of alewife compared to the population of predators was way out of balance. So the DNR had to find some predator fish 
and they chose these Pacific Ocean fish. And we're going to talk specifically today about the Chinook salmon, since that's the one that's running up here today. So the DNR stocked these in Lake Michigan in the 60s. And they initially put them in at Strawberry Creek, if you're familiar with Sturgeon Bay. Strawberry Creek, and even, uh, I think they were on the news, I think, one night this week um, as well. Strawberry Creek's where the first salmon went in. And that money comes directly back here to the facility. So it's a very nice, it's a nice example of the money that you purchase to use something actually comes right back to fund the activity that you're pursuing. So that salmon and trout stamp money comes right back here and that's our operating budget for this facility. Now these salmon are Pacific Ocean salmon. They've adjusted just fine to living their entire lives in fresh water. However, if you look out west, they run up the tributaries of the Pacific Ocean. And the tributaries of Wisconsin are very different than the tributaries of the Pacific Ocean. And these salmon, in particular, need three conditions to happen in the river. They need river water to be very cold, very clear, and very highly oxygenated. And if they don't have highly oxygenated, cold and clear water, their eggs will not hatch. The Kiwani River, in addition to other rivers in Wisconsin that flow into Lake Michigan, are very turbid and they're warm, which means that they don't have very much oxygen or enough oxygen to support these eggs to hatch. <coughs> so we are here then as an egg collection facility. We don't raise any fish here on site, but we're here as an egg collection facility so that we can keep having a sport fishing uh, population in Lake Michigan. If you look at Michigan shoreline along Lake Michigan, they have a lot of natural shoreline, a lot of sand dunes, not a lot of agriculture. Yeah. So we have a significant amount of agriculture here in the watershed all along Lake Michigan. And what happens is when it rains, a lot of that soil and silt and clay will run into the, into the river systems to the point that if we have a very strong rain, our river will look like chocolate milk the next day. So we've been working, the DNR has been working with farmers over the last several years to come up with best management practices to try to help eliminate some of that runoff that goes into the river systems. However, it's still enough that we just can't sustain natural reproduction. There's just too much runoff that happens into our rivers. So even though Michigan does have some natural reproduction, we don't have any in the state of Wisconsin. So a little bit about, kind of let's talk a little bit about the life cycle of the salmon so you can kind of appreciate how, how things are happening here this time of year. I will mention though that the run, the Chinook salmon run, will run through the month of October. So you can come back any time the month of October and probably see fish around here. Um, rainbows will run in the springtime, but the big difference between the rainbows or really between trout and salmon Salmon spawn once in their lifetime and then they die. And they spawn right before their, the end of their life. Trout will return many times to us. So our runs of trout, for example, in the springtime are variable. We could have a hundred fish come through or several hundred or maybe even a thousand fish come through if the river conditions are appropriate. They're very fussy about the kind of water that they come up in. It needs to be cold and it needs to be high. If they don't have those kinds of conditions, they'll reabsorb their eggs and go out to Lake Michigan and try the next year. Salmon don't have that luxury. They have to come up once before, they have to come up and they do that only once right before they die. So we always know that every fall we're going to have a very good run because they're going to come up to us no matter what kind of conditions they see in the river. Their life cycle and how long is that? Three, four years? These salmon, right, the Chinooks live to be four years old. The Cohos will live to be about three years old. So the, when I give tours in the, during the week to school kids, if I get the really little kids out, like the preschoolers, and they see these fish and I ask them, well, how old do you think they are, right? And because these fish are about as long as those little kids are tall, they always think they're about 100 years old. <laughs> so they're very surprised to know, learn that they are actually older than these fish are. Um, so the salmon live to be four years old. The Chinook live to be four years old. They'll come up the river and we'll take their eggs here at the facility and fertilize the eggs. The eggs then go to hatcheries. The Chinook primarily will go to Kettle Moraine Springs 
It's around Sheboygan, about a half hour south of Sheboygan. Over winter, those eggs are going to hatch, and in the springtime, those fish will come back to us. Salmon do something called imprinting. That's how they remember where home is. And they imprint on the smell of the water. So if you think about this, out west, where that's where they're natively found, that's where they're, they're known to be, they will run up the river systems out west and they remember or imprint on the water they're born in, in the river system. And they remember the smell of the water and then go back out to the ocean. Here in Wisconsin, we have to trick them a little bit to thinking that they were born here in the Kiwani River. So when we raise them in the hatcheries, before they reach imprinting length, and their imprinting is actually based on the length of the fish as opposed to the age of the fish. So before they reach a certain length, we're gonna stock them back into the river so that they remember the smell of the Kiwani River instead of the hatchery water. So they'll remember the smell and imprint on the Kiwani River, thinking that that's where they were born, and they will swim out to Lake Michigan and live to be four years old. So if you think about this, the fish that you see here today are only here because they've traveled not only seven miles in low water to reach us, but because they're remembering a smell of water, no less, from four years ago and have followed their sense of smell throughout Lake Michigan all the way back here to us today. So it's a pretty amazing feat, at least it's a, I, I think it's pretty amazing because I can't imagine how this water smells any different than any other water would smell, <laughs> particularly trying to remember a smell from four years ago. Yeah. So that's why the salmon are here today because they imprint on the water when they're stocked and we will stock them at a variety of points in the river to make sure that we have a return. We'll stock them above us as well as below us. Okay, I'm going to talk to you for just a moment or two about the dam and our fishway and a couple things I'd like you to uh, take a look at in the fishway and then we're going to talk again on the other side of the fishway on the other side of that brown um, bridge. So when the salmon get up this far, and sometimes I can give this talk and on cue one will try to get up the dam. Mm -hmm. However, I don't know if they will today. But we've dammed the Kiwani River in such a way that we've made the apron nice and wide so that the salmon have to go through our fishway. They cannot jump over this dam, whether there's water running on it or not, because they don't have the lift to get up and over. They'll just end up trying to swim up the dam. So eventually they'll work their way over to our fishway. Now, these fish are very attracted to the flow of water. The stronger the flow of water, the stronger their desire is to go against that flow. So we've provided in our fishway a series of jump pools and waterfalls available to the fish, trying to increase that flow to draw them up into our collection ponds. After our fishway then is our fish ladder, which is just some really steep steps or jumps on their final journey up to our collection pond. And I always get questions, how come you make it so hard? But remember, these fish are hardwired to go against the current or against that flow of water. That's what they're designed to do. We wanted to be able to control fish coming up our fishway. So we can put a bunch of boards in there to block that whole, to block our whole fish channel off, if we would want. So. I see a lot more um, ones already. Yeah, that's only since yesterday. <laughs> it's there, the heat. Some guy was walking. Um, some young guy was walking in there and throwing fish through that gate. Um, do they? Do we have lampreys? We don't see a lot of lampreys coming up here, but we see a lot of fish with the scars of lampreys so on them. So they're still around? Yeah, oh yeah, they're still around. Are they still trying to control them? They are. In fact, they on several tributaries, they'll do um, poisoning. When you write a ticket for someone fishing in the refuge, mm -hmm. what's, how expensive is that ticket? A couple hundred bucks. Okay, that's what I say. I asked you to take a look for a couple things in the fishway. I asked you to look at the coloring. What did you notice about the colors of these fish? What predominantly coloring are you looking at? Are you seeing? Very dark. Very dark, right. Now, have any of you gone fishing on the lake for these fish? What color are they out there? 
Silver. They change to that dark color at the end of their lives when they're coming up the rivers to spawn. Did you notice any markings on these fish in the fishway? No? What about their noses and their tails? Did you notice the coloring there? That white color? The white one. I can see the white one. Now, the coloring, like their noses, for example, are white a lot of times because, remember, they're going nose first or face first up the river. And with all the low water that we have, they're hitting a lot of rocks and they're getting quite banged up and bruised. Now, the white parts that you see on their tails or even sometimes on their backs, you'll notice that they're white. When you go fishing, these fish are typically slimy, right? If you've ever taken a fish off a hook, you know how slimy they can be. These fish are the same thing. However, when they hit those rocks, or when they're traveling up river and they encounter low water, that slime layer gets scraped right off of the fish, and a fungus will grow in its place. And all that white stuff that you see on the tail, sometimes on the back of the fish, and sometimes even on the sides of the fish, that's all a fungus growing on them. And that fungus stresses them out. I guess it would stress me out too if I had fungus growing all over me. So when they get up into our collection ponds, we use salt to mellow them out and as an abrasive to, to kind of help with that slime layer. If you think about it as humans, we use salt like salt scrubs and it, whatever, like for pumicing our skin. And it does the same thing when we throw 50 pound bags of salt in our ponds. Salt, for some reason, will mellow the fish out if they get stressed. It just calms them down a little bit, which is always good. And it also acts as an abrasive to take some of that slime layer off of them as well. So did you notice anything about the behavior of the fish in the fishway? They were pretty inactive, but did you see any that were thrashing about at each other? Earlier today I noticed that. And a lot of times what happens is the males will fight each other. And the males will fight each other for the females. In fact, I have um, people ask me a lot of times when they see our collection ponds, they want to know what we're feeding these fish as we're holding them here. And the truth is, we don't have to feed them anything because they haven't eaten since probably August. In the month of August, out on the lake, they will gorge themselves full of fish, and that's their last meal. Once they start their journey up river, they no longer eat. And if you think about it, and keep this in mind at the end of our tour when we talk to Paul, and he opens up the, the female for you and a male to show you their insides, if they're full of fish in August, and they've stretched their stomach out to the degree that they have fish actually coming out of their gullet, as they metabolize that fish, and their stomach starts to shrink, it leaves their body cavity available for all of the eggs that they hold, or the milk that they hold if they're a male. So as these fish are coming up river, they're no longer e interested in eating, and we certainly don't have to feed them here in our ponds at all. So you got a chance to see the fishway, and you may not have seen any kind of fighting fish, and I'm not sure, I don't hear a lot of jumping behind me. Um, that sounded like a big fish though. Um, but what's next to us then is this fish ladder I was telling you about, and it's these big steep steps of fish. So what I would like to do now is take a walk down into the viewing room, and we can look through the window and see if we see any fish down there. I um, mean, it'll give you a little better idea of what the uh, ladder looks like. Uh, but before we go, does anybody have any questions at all? Nancy, yeah. How much weight will they average lose? from the last time they eat until they get up? That's an excellent question, and I don't have an answer for you. You asked how much weight would they lose between yeah. like August and now? Right. Ask um, our fish biologist that. He may have a good answer for you. Yeah. Yeah, the sea lamprey barrier. Can you say something about that? Oh, sure. We have a sea lamprey barrier in place here. A lot of times we won't see sea lamprey up this far on the fish because with all the jumping that they're doing, they're pretty well knocked off. But occasionally you will. And a lot of times if we're going to see lamprey at all, it'll be the single lamprey itself, not attached to the fish. Now this doesn't happen very often, but the barriers are in place so that the lamprey can't get up any farther upriver from us so that the lamprey stay at this point of the river and go no higher. 
So that's why we have those screens in place. How does that work? How does it work to exclude the lamprey as opposed to the fish? From the, we just won't open up the screens. During the certain times of the year that the lamprey come up, the lamprey themselves will come up at different times of the year than the fish per se. But how does it separate one from the other? Oh, it doesn't. But if the, if the lamprey are um, are coming up by, the, they don't need a fish to come to us. So if they came up by themselves, that's what the screens would do. For example, the lamprey will spawn in the rivers. So when we know that's taking place, we'll definitely keep those barriers closed so they can't go upriver to spawn from us. These pumps are only running when we're operating. So we turned them on on Tuesday and we'll turn them off probably whenever we're done working fish. So if you would come to us in, say, July or February or March, this would, be dry there. This would all be dry. Yep. Below us. Um, to get them because it's too shallow for them to come up. They don't want to come up all this way. The, the water level is too low. So we'll have to shock deep holes below us for browns in November. So it's unusual to see them in the window. Um, how do they get the eggs from the Lakers? We don't take eggs from Lakers. Do you know how they get them? No. Oh, okay. what, what do you mean shock deep holes? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, we go out in a boat, in a John boat, and we have, um, um, with electrical current, the water, just enough to stun them to come to the surface so we can grab them with a net. And then you do the same and then, thing. And then we bring them back here, and then we do the whole process with them here. So, yeah, it's... No. However, if you stand out here long enough, I guarantee you that there are fish in every pond. And the reason for that is because they'll jump over the concrete walls. I'll have fish out on the sidewalk when I come in from come into work. And for the longest time I thought someone was playing a joke on me. Until I actually saw it for myself. And they actually jump through the fence and they end up on the sidewalk. So they're very aggressive fish. The reason why we try to control where they are is because it helps us at least initially get a handle on how many fish we have and where they are. Okay. So this is how we bring the fish up into the workroom. They come up this basket here. He's going to raise the basket up and dump them into the knockout tank. The knockout tank is filled with water and carbon dioxide that puts the fish to sleep. These are a very powerful fish. Much easier to work with when they're sleeping. So he's going to do that right now. They'll sit in the knockout tank for a couple minutes. Once they're out of the knockout tank, if we're taking eggs for the hatchery, we're going to measure and weigh every fish that comes through the facility. We're also going to look for marks and identify if it's a male or female and what species of fish it is. We use the term girl and boy a lot. We will not use the term male and female because when you're in there, it's really noisy and it's very hard to determine if someone is going to yell male or female to hear that difference. So we will yell girl and boy. So once the fish are out of the knockout tank, they go on the sorting table and we're going to take data from them, measure and weigh them, what species they are. We're going to look for lamprey wounds. That's something we keep track of as well. Nan right now is the one taking data from the fish. They're going to yell out to her different things and she's going to record it. Once they're once all that data is recorded, they come over here. She's just showing you right now the different organs of the fish. The girls get hung up here on this rack. We're going to take a needle and we're going to inject her belly with compressed air. That stimulates her to drop her eggs really quickly. It doesn't harm her and it keeps the eggs very healthy. So she's going to do, oh, she's going to take a male. The males we just take by hand and squeeze the milt out of them. Combining the milt and the eggs together does absolutely nothing. It needs water. The sperm is only active for about 90 seconds once it has contact with water. So once they mix the milt and the eggs together, pour water over it, they'll let it sit for a couple of minutes. Then they're going to rinse the eggs off. We have buckets that have screens in the bottom of them instead of a hard plastic bottom. So they'll wash the eggs off and they're ready to go to the hatchery. Watch Lynn here, she's going to inject the belly with compressed air and you'll see how fast she drops her eggs. 
It's a very efficient way to get her eggs out of her. We do the same thing with the trout in the springtime. And after, the trout, after we're done working the trout, they survive this. We will put them in a recovery tank, wank them up, and put them back in the river. That's how we take the eggs. The eggs then go in those five gallon pails and they'll go to the hatchery. Now, we have some, we have some fish that are getting slid back to the ponds. We have two tubes here. One says back to pond one, the other says back to pond two. Those are the tubes that those fish go in to go back to the ponds. We have water flowing through those tubes. It's like a water slide for the fish. However, we have to wake the fish up before we send them back to the ponds. Why would that be? What happens if you send a sleeping fish back to the water? Do you know? It'll drown. Right, very good. So way in the back, you can see there's a guy right now um, digging around in that vat. That vat has really cold water in it. And we send any fish that we need to wake back up into that vat. We revive the fish, allow it to come to, then we'll slide it back to the ponds. So when we work trout in the springtime, that's what we do with all of our trout. They survive the spawning process, we wake them up, after we take the eggs, they go back to the river. You see occasionally if you hang around long enough, um, people scrubbing each other's backs with what looks like blood. It isn't blood, it's iodine. And we need to disinfect all of our gear and all of our gear stays here because we don't want... The virus was confirmed VHS, viral hemorrhagic septicemia, in Lake Michigan this summer. So some of our fish may have that virus. When we're taking eggs for the hatchery, we will... ...side of the bridge at the end of the road where you turned in. That you can fish from there and downriver. But right here, you're in a protected area called a fish refuge, and you're not allowed to fish here. What are they doing at the inspector? She's just showing you all the insides. Well, she's been looking at everyone. She's just showing everybody different because we're doing two disinfections this year instead of just the one for the eggs, doing it with iodine. Also, important to anglers, very important to anglers, is in years past, for the six years I've been here, anybody who calls me up on the telephone and asks me where they want to fish, I will tell them to fish above us because there's not as many people, it's quieter, and there's a fair amount of fish that we release above us. Since the VHS virus, we are not, no longer allowed, don't want any fish going above the first barrier on any tributary on Lake Michigan um, to, to keep them. What did we go make in that building? Oh, did you make a shirt? Yeah. Oh, very good. Very, very good. A yellow fish. I'll eat with you if you give me two seconds. Yeah. Okay, very good. Where did he go? So this was if you replace us at the base. Uh, Carol Schultz from Sevastopol, Laddie Chapman doing some, has just done a videotaping of the uh, Buzz Pazadny uh, open house for the for the salmon stripping facility here in uh, Kiwani. You'll uh, thank you for watching. I'm certain you uh, will appreciate what a major activity this is in uh, stripping the salmon, uh, spawning the fish, and eventually uh, uh, pl again planting them, having them come back and where they, uh, are the eggs and milk are removed from the, the fish. So thanks again for watching.